Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fourth webinar of the California's Best Practices Pathways from Prison to College series. My name is Kenya Miranda Verdugo, and I am the Smart Justice Program Manager with the Michelson 20MM Foundation. Thank you for joining this conversation where we will discuss California's best practices for students thriving on campus. Before we begin, and as we give folks a few minutes to hop on Zoom, I would like to share a bit of background on our foundation and describe what we have in store for you today. Founded by Dr. Gary K. Michelson and Alia Michelson, the Michelson 20MM Foundation is a private nonprofit organization that seeks to accelerate progress towards a more just world through grant making, programs, and impact investing. Four years ago, we launched our Smart Justice Initiative to leverage higher education as a catalytic force for transforming the lives of justice-involved individuals, while also reforming the justice system itself. We work to transform the communities impacted by our country's punitive legal system to forge brighter, more prosperous futures via education. As part of that commitment, we were proud to recently form the Smart Justice Think Tank, which is a coalition of higher education champions and directly impacted leaders in California. The Smart Justice Think Tank developed a guiding framework to inform a common agenda for scholars, advocates, practitioners, legislators, and reentry organizations in post-secondary higher education, in prison, and on-campus programs. This framework is what we call California's Best Practices, Pathways from Prison to College. We will drop a link to our California's Best Practices landing page in the chat where you can download the best practices and take the pledge as a show of commitment to centering the needs of formerly and currently incarcerated students. Next slide, please. Today, we have the honor of hosting a few members of the Think Tank who will share their expertise in having helped formerly incarcerated students legislatively, educationally, and institutionally. As a note, the opinions expressed in this webinar are each participant's own perspective, which in no way represent the opinions or views of the Michelson 20MM Foundation. Before we get started, I would like to remind everyone that you will be able to ask questions via the Zoom Q&A function throughout panel discussions. Next slide, please. During our previous webinar, we learned about the barriers that students transitioning out of prisons face and how the best practices can ensure that adopting institutions and organizations break them down. Today, we will discuss the struggles that formerly incarcerated students face when, an, when arriving on campus and how the best practices address these challenges. Next slide, please. So part of the best practices um, that we will be discussing during this webinar is going to be students should have access to information and resources available on campus, which includes mental health services, food pantries, parking vouchers, child support, computer literacy. Students deserve access to advising hours with campus departments, which includes financial aid, basic needs centers, counseling, and psychological services. In addition to community resources that should be available to transition students in order to provide information about employment and licensing barriers due to conviction and given assistance to obtain legal advice as needed to better assist their pursuit of a career. Previous slide, please. The other best practices for this portion is that students deserve faculty and staff who have received professional development training led by directly impacted individuals through an anti-deficit framework that centers on racial equity, access, and humanizing language. Students should be provided academic and career counselors to evaluate transcripts and create comprehensive educational plans. Students should have access to pathways for graduate education and networks of support for beyond graduation. And students should be given work study opportunities via OCPs collaborating with campus partners. End of the slide, please. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the panelists that will be speaking today. We have Dr. James Banal, who is Executive Director of Project Rebound, California State University, Long Beach. 
Dr. Benal is an Associate Professor of Law, Criminology, and Criminal Justice at CSU Long Beach. Dr. Benal is also the Faculty Advisor for Rising Scholars and the Executive Director of Project Rebound. He is a practicing attorney and a formerly incarcerated person who spent just over four years in prison for a DUI homicide that claimed the life of his close friend. While incarcerated, Dr. Bernal took his LSATs and was accepted to law school. Once released, he earned, he earned his JD and LLM, was admitted to the State Bar of California in 2008, and received his PhD in Criminology, Law, and Society from the University of California, Irvine in 2014. I would also like to introduce Jennifer Gomez, who is the program coordinator for UC Irvine's LIFTED program, which stands for Leveraging Inspiring Futures Through Educational Degrees, the first UC bachelor degree granting program for currently incarcerated individuals. She is also an access ambassador for Cal Voices, the oldest continuously operating peer-run consumer advocacy agency in California. Jennifer is a formerly incarcerated alumni of UC San Diego, where she received her BA in political science with a concentration in race, ethnicity, and politics. She has successfully worked towards securing ongoing funding from the California State Legislature for justice impacted students and has helped implement policy change through SB 990, which is a County of Transfer Bill, and SB 629, which is the uh, ID Cards Bill. Jennifer's purpose in life is to use her lived experience to advocate for and help empower others to affect policy change to end systemic barriers and mass incarceration. It is also my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joe Luis Hernandez, Director of Rising Scholars at Mount San Antonio College. Joe Luis is the current director for the Rising Scholars Program at Mount San Antonio College. He is also an alumni of the college he is also an alumni of the college and graduated in 2014 with his associate's degree in social and behavioral sciences. Since his graduation, he has received a bachelor's from Cal State University Los Angeles in, re in rehabilitation services and a master's degree from Long Beach State, focusing on student development and higher education. Joe Lewis's passion for serving the student population arises from his own experience with incarceration and having gone through the criminal justice system. In what he now terms as coming home, he serves students just like him in navigating higher education. We are also honored to have Hector Cervantes joining us, who is the director of the Underground Scholars Program at UC Irvine. He is a formerly incarcerated person from Santa Ana, California, who completed his undergraduate and graduate studies at UC Irvine. In 2018, Hector was part of the student group effort to establish the Underground Scholars Initiative student organization on campus. In 2021, he was appointed director of the program. So I wanna give a really big welcome to all of our panelists. We will now begin the panel discussion. And as a reminder to the audience, please feel free to ask questions to our panel using the Q&A function during this discussion, not the Zoom chat. Um, I want to kick off the first question to Jennifer. Um, could I please ask you if you could describe some barriers that you have encountered while attending a California public college and university? Um, some of the barriers I faced were, I think, just an accrual of the amount of time it took me to go back to college. Um, I went back to community college when I was 37 years old, and I had previously gone to community college and to um, a university. And so when I started back, um, I had all these units, right? So I, I wasn't eligible for EOPS, the free books, other like support systems. Um, they told me I had too many units. It was also difficult for me because I ended up having to take out student loans because I maxed out on my financial aid. Um, and also, I found it really difficult to communicate my story and get adequate support from counseling services, um, mainly because counseling services had like a 15 minute time limit that they could meet with you. And when I was trying to explain all the different avenues it had taken me to get to where I was and what I was hoping to do, I kept being told I'd have to schedule another appointment. Um, which could take like a month. Um, so it was really hard navigating where I was going and what I was doing. I ended up 
getting a complete associate's degree when I only needed about a year of credits, um, which isn't really a negative thing because I'm really happy with my associate's degree. But it, it's also one thing is I probably wouldn't have had to take out um, student loans if I had only gone to school for one year instead of two years. Um, and I think mainly the barriers that I faced were these these barriers that are just not what traditional students have where they get out of high school or they just go straight into community college and then transfer to a university. Um, I was really lucky with faculty being very supportive. I was very open about my past and um, that I, I was actually in drug court when I went back to school. I was very honest with them. And so faculty was really supportive. It was more the institutional barriers that I faced. Thank you for your answer. Does, would anybody else like to take a stab at the question? And I'll repeat it. Um, if you could describe some barriers you have encountered while attending a California public college um, or university. Hector, please. Thank you. Yeah, so for me, it was really just navigating college and understanding what it meant to go to college. I think was one of the, the biggest barriers for me. I started going to school a year after I discharged from parole. And my main focus was to not go back to prison. Um, and I I knew college could help me do that. I just didn't know how. Um, I was fortunate that, you know, I just continued moving forward and I found a mentor. Um, but I understand that other folks may just be discouraged from even just, Higher ed is a is a puzzle, and you, it's really hard, I think, with folks from our background to understand what higher ed can do for you. And I think um, that's a gap, or maybe I don't know. Uh, to on my experience, I think it's a, an existing gap, and I think it's something that we need to do a better job at, and really breaking down what is higher ed, how do you move from one degree to another, and what does it mean? You know, like. Just as a small example, I was on a call yesterday with a community college students, and they didn't know that you can go from a bachelor's straight into a PhD, um, things like that. Or they didn't know that you can go straight from a bachelor's to a law school. They think you have to get a master's and then move up the chain. So just things like that. Or So yeah, I, I don't want to you know, go too deep into my answer. I, I think I communicated my point. And then aside from that, the financial aspect, so I worked full-time, went to school full-time. I understand that, you know, other folks have children. I didn't have children at the time, so I was able to do that. Um, I did, however, have other family responsibilities, um, you know, being primary caregiver of my mom, um, things like that. So, you know, I think as formerly incarcerated students, we tend to be older, we tend to have children. We also tend to have other uh, family responsibilities, and I think those are real barriers uh, to access in higher education. And I'll go ahead and leave it at that. Thank you for that. I can add a little bit to that. I think it's also the misinformation on what students can do. I know in grad school, one of my professors told me one time that I probably wouldn't be able to work at a community college because of my background. And, and so I think those are the things that I tend um, to teach my staff here and the college on what are the new laws, what's going on, right? If we look at the educational code, it gives you a parameter of when you can focus on the background, when you can't focus on the background, and that was pre-Fair um, Chance Hiring Act. So I think that's the misinformation that sometimes runs rampant, even in financial aid, even you know everywhere that the students might not know. I think that's, I think, crazy. For me, I think once I understood that higher education was a hustle, just like the streets, and 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 I had the skills already. It became easier um, to navigate higher education and create, you know, those connections, building, you know, uh, um, relationships with people, and and that's really what higher ed's about is a relationship and a transaction. And I did that selling dope. I did that, you know, running through the hood. I did that, you know, all that. And I think that's what I teach my students in a way is letting them know like this is. You already have the strength. You already have the knowledge, because a lot of people are going to tell them, "Well, you don't. You didn't come prepared academically. You didn't come this. You didn't come that." But I, I think when we begin to let them know that there is strengths that they have, it gives them a little bit more confidence to be more successful 
in in um in any institution. What I tell my counselors, the academic counselors, is I let them know like their main purpose here is to believe so much in the student that they feel they're going to accomplish whatever educational path you set forth. And I think that's the most important thing is, is the key factors of who, which are the staff members they're coming into contact with. Because for myself and, and listening to Hector and, and Jennifer and I know Dr. Banal and knowing him personally, those people that, that came into our lives really changed the way that those trajectories kind of, um, kind of just, like I'm a director now at a community college with administrators where they said I might not be you know, I, I said I'm with the president's council some days, right? So I think when they said you might not be able to work there, but here I am. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing that. And I'm sure your students are really, really lucky to have you because again, you all are teaching them stuff that they can't really learn through textbooks or, you know, really in the classroom. Um, so your lessons definitely go beyond that. Thank you for sharing. Uh, my next question is, what opportunities and resources have aided you in accomplishing your academic goals? Um, I'll, I'll lead off if that's all right. I didn't attend a university in California until I went to Irvine, and there were really no obstacles, well, really there when I was doing my PhD. I think I was far enough along, um, so I didn't speak to the last question. As far as this question goes, um, for me, it was relationships. It was the relationships that I made. So this is what helped us, right? What provided opportunities. And for me, it was uh, the folks that I ran into, as Joe mentioned, um, I think we all have them. Uh, people that we run into during our, maybe our undergrad or maybe, you know, in the, in the time immediately post-confinement when we're first released, um, if we are formally incarcerated, that take an interest in us. Um, and believe that, that that we are more than a state number, more than sort of chattel, right? That was incarcerated somewhere in a warehouse. Um, and I think those folks that that saw me as sort of having strengths, right? Having things that um, I could bring to the community that made all the difference in the world for me. Uh, because in the system, right? You're not told that. Um, you're told, frankly, that you're worthless and that you're just a sort of piece of property, et cetera. And so those those people, I will say, were probably the biggest influence in me uh, moving along after I was in prison. I can go. <laughs> Thanks, James. Um, for me, I think it was like how James said, the people that we meet, the network that we build. Um, I was really lucky when I started community college that I got into this um, academic honor society called Phi Theta Kappa. Um, and I think it was really important too that it was not a formally incarcerated student organization. It was an organization for anybody who achieved a 3.5 or higher. Um, and it just so happened that the year, it was within the year that I became a member that PTK Phi Theta Kappa um, had its first formerly incarcerated international president, um, James Harvey Elliott II. I'm going to give him a shout out. Um, it was so influential to see someone who was formerly incarcerated running an international honor society of the community colleges. Um, and it really just pushed me to go for a leadership position. So I ended up becoming the executive vice president of our chapter at Southwestern College. Um, I gained so many friends from that experience and um, our advisor, she is still in contact with me. Um, I consider those friends family that I have from that. And that really boosted me to make other um, networking connections at Southwestern College. It's how I ended up meeting the, um, the project specialist of um, restorative justice and the director of restorative justice at Southwestern College. Um, they also introduced me to Underground Scholars, which is how I became part of Underground Scholars um, at UCSD. And from there, I just kept networking. Um, the people in Underground Scholars have really supported me throughout my entire academic career. I'm still part of Underground Scholars, even though I'm an alumni now. Um, and I think it's just really important that 
you as a person take these like leaps of faith in trusting people who are willing to be there to support you because I really think that um, those people can help mentor you and help you navigate um, all the intricacies of higher education. I can add to it. Um, so for me, it was having counseling or mental health services here on campus. Um, prior to coming to UCI, I, I really didn't understand the value of extracurricular activities. I just went to work. I went, I went to work, went to class, went home, and I did that over and over until um, I finally had enough credits to transfer. When it came to time to transfer, I didn't even know the difference between a CSU and a UC. I always say that I ended up at UCI by accident because I missed the CSU deadline. <laughs> but it wasn't until I got to UCI that my my life dramatically changed. I feel like, you know, I had uh, health care, mental health services, basic needs, financial aid. I was able to quit my job and just focus on being a student. It was really a life-changing experience. Um, and while all of those things really, um, you know, aided me, it was through underground scholars and building my network and building community on campus that allowed me uh, to really, you know, take actions to advance, you know, my academic and professional career um, by taking advantage of all of the resources that UCI gave me. But there was that community and that network on campus through underground scholars that um, that really gave me an extra boost. And I think for us at Long Beach, it was having to start our own because of being in a different system than the, the underground scholars. They were working there, they were UC based. So we had to go out and start our own Irene Sotelo, Adrian Vasquez, and Dr. Banal, and, and um, there was Del Lundrum. That we had to create our own circle of like, this is who we were going to be. And I, and I think. Um, and, and that helped, but I think the one thing that also helped me was expanding beyond into like professional organizations that that dealt like, if I wanted to work in student affairs, I went to the student affairs uh, organizations and began to get connected on those campuses and began to get connected with those people like in community colleges, organizations that, that kind of have that focus. And then I think the other thing that we did is I, I hit up a lot of project rebounds and the only person that hit me up was um, Jason and Dr. Bernal. And, and I think those were like the people, cause we were at Long Beach, we didn't have nothing and, the, and, and they helped us out. But I think the other thing that Dr. Bernal exposed us to was to research, was to the power of doing, you know, he sat on my thesis, a committee, you know, we presented at, at conferences. He took us to Atlanta, he took us to Savannah right, all these places that, like, fuck, I didn't even know that I could, I, what, what Savannah was, right, going to places that I only seen on, on TV or, or I didn't read it a lot, so I didn't read about these places, but like having those experiences, right, and, and, and I think that the people in your life really impact you in a way, you know, where, where I remember one of my first presentations professionally was in, in Hawaii, right, because one of my mentors and one of my professors was like, you should submit a presentation. And I think those people gave us that aspect of being able to, to do all that and have, have those dreams and then just make those connections in those particular places of where you wanna be. And I think as I, I'm more in student affairs than with like beyond the bars and, and NCHIP. And so I often feel alone, but I do get to hang out with like Irene and, and, and all my friends here. But I think I, I, I'm, Right. I'm struggling at like NASPA, the largest student affairs profession, and, and really having them focus on formerly incarcerated students and feeling like I want to be like, no, nah, I don't want to go no more. But if I give up, then that those were, that's where all the, the vice presidents and everybody that's higher up on these campuses are at. They're not going to know about this. So continuing to, to be in those spaces, I think. So I, I have to come back. And, and I think it is really that community that, that helps. Yeah, I was going to say, I think, you know, the commonality in all of y'all's responses was having that community and having, you know, those people help uplift you. And I think this is one of the reasons why 
um, the Smart Justice Think Tank came up with the best practices is so that when that question is asked, yes, community is beautiful, but it, so you can also say, you know, the institutions backed me up there, you know, there was um, avenues or program sets, you know, for our success. Um, and that's really what the best practices want to tackle is to be additional resources um, because community, some, not everybody, you know, gets to take advantage of that or has the opportunity, especially, for example, with Zoom, um, you know, a lot of things are online. So sometimes it's a little harder to, to build community, um, you know, through a virtual world. Uh, so this is really one of the reasons why the best practices was created. And thank you all so much for, for your responses to that question. My next question is, um, can any of you recall if you have experienced discrimination because of your status as a formerly incarcerated student um, on campus? Uh, I'll lead off. Um, I think the answer is probably gonna be yes across the board. So I'll just, <laughs> I'll just open it up and be yes. The answer is simple. Um, for me, I uh, sat in a criminal law class six months after walking out of state prison. And I can recall hearing my classmates talk about those people uh, and, you know, felons, et cetera, et cetera, right? And in discussions of the criminal law, but still, um, you know, kind of rubs you the wrong way and made me at least feel, this is back in 05, right? So let's be clear about context, made me feel um, you know, I can't disclose and I didn't have a community and I don't know who I can talk to. And these folks are going to think I'm this weird alien that was dropped in from a prison to a law school. Right. Um, and it felt that way, frankly, at the beginning. Um, but there were other, I think all of us, not only there's that, right. But I was also struggling sort of personally, right? I didn't have a driver's license. I was walking to school, books were heavy, right. We, there's lots of things. And so when you add all that together, um, yeah, I think that uh, it, it was sort of more poignant, right. To feel that, um, to feel the way folks talked about me and the population that I was then a part of and still are a part of, right. From incarcerated folks. Um, yeah, maybe it wasn't directed personally, but that sort of sense in the classroom um, definitely made for an environment where I was um, guarded and, and wasn't necessarily ready to, to talk about my past uh, at that time. So yeah, that would be the stigma that I, I encountered. I think I can even add, like just the simple, may not be the overt discrimination, but the omission of our student population. I think that often occurs when there's conversations centered on equity or or, or um, supporting minoritized students. Is this is one of the populations that is never really um, brought up, right? And having some days I feel like I had to be in the meeting the other day and I'm like, y'all weren't talking about us until I came. So, right, we're not in those data markers. We're not in, in, in those things when they're like, oh, well, let's look at the data. Let's look at that. Let's look at this. I, I think that's that. Of, that's being discriminated on just by om omitting who we are, right? And, and, and what we need to the specific needs. I think that's being more intentional of the service of what are you meaning when you're, when you're trying to serve a student. I, as a professional now, I think I faced um, having to write statements of rehabilitation for my jobs, right? And, and knowing the law and fighting it, and then and the HR people just being like, can you just please do, like, please, write it, please. And I'm like, I know I don't have to, right? But I think those are, because they have, in 2005, that was a sentiment. And I, and I think in 2023, it's still a sentiment. It just may be less. And I think it's just going to continue to be us advocating for, for these populations and, and advocating for, for what it is that, that we need in, in, in those instances. Thank you for those responses. Um, I will move on to the next question, which is, do you feel that prison education programs on the inside prepared you and or your students to succeed on a college campus? Um, I can speak a little bit to the lifted program and what we're trying to do to support our students who transition um, to campus. Um, Personally, I really feel like it's really important for an educational program to not only include the 
classes, the lecture, the professor, the textbooks, um, that type of education that they're receiving. I think that education, higher education includes all the different things that we've already been talking about. It talk, it includes um, joining groups, it, it includes reaching out to mentors, it includes making connections with professors and that larger community. So what we're really trying to do for our incarcerated students, in addition to the courses that they are taking, is um, help them create their own underground scholars chapter, which they've done. Um, they're very proud of that. They meet weekly um, to support each other. They're also reaching out to community college students on the yard. Um, and we are bringing in mentors such as Hector, Gabriel Salas, and other underground scholars to meet with our students. Um, it's just really important that they have that sort of I feel like they have that sort of self-worth and understanding that they have people that care about them um, on the inside and on the outside so that when they do transition, they feel comfortable reaching out to people for support. Um, so that's one thing that Lifted is working on. Yeah, I didn't. Ex I didn't uh, experience um, higher ed while I was incarcerated. Just juvenile hall, high school. It's about. It. <laughs> I think I took a, a community college course when I was in juvenile hall, but yeah, not not in prison. I think yeah, I did not. I did not have that experience either. I taught GED classes inside, but I did not have the experience of uh, of education inside. I think I can speak from the experiences of encountering the community college students that come here to Mount Zach and really having to be intentional of sometimes they're not they're not given the awareness of what all the classes they're taking are leading towards. And so they come here with a vast variety of classes. And so we we have to be intentional of pulling all their transcripts from every college that they may attend classes at if they weren't maybe like in a structured program that provided them the, the guidance and to make sure that they don't they're not retaking courses that they already took. You know, we, we had one of our students, um, we were gonna put him in a 1C and then our counselor was like, let me check his transcripts. And right before the, the, the class had started, his final transcript came in and showed that he had already taken the class, right? So it was like being prepared that might even set them back because the transcripts don't all come in at the same time. They're not all evaluated at the same time. Sometimes I have to call our admissions and records myself personally, like with a homie of mine and be like, hey, can you pull this? Can you check this? And, and I think those are the things that we need to, to make sure that when they come here, they're prepared, right? That, that they know what their classes led to. What I had at Rio Hondo is they were in a program that they only offered a specific degree. And when they came to school, they wanted something totally different. It wasn't what they wanted, but they were taking advantage of what they had. And, and, and I think that forcing them right, for that good time credit was like their only way of taking these classes. But then they come to, then they came to school with a whole nother different degree that they didn't never wanted. They wanted to be a dancer. They wanted to be something else and want to take something else. So having to sometimes even restart, even though they already took those classes, took specific classes while they were incarcerated. Thank you um, for your responses and for sharing either your experience or your students' experience. Um, I'll now be moving on to the next question, uh, which is, were you or any of your students on probation, parole, or community supervision while attending college? And if so, uh, can you speak a little bit about that experience and how it impacted your experience as a student or their experience as a student? Um. So I'll start if that's all right. I, I, cause this is actually how I got started in my career. Um, so yes, I was on uh, parole, active pre AB 109 parole. Um, so I was out here prior to that passing and uh, I was on active parole the whole time I was in law school. And so what that meant was obviously for those of us who've been on supervision, right? Monthly urine analysis, oftentimes pop-ins at the house, right? Um, so yes, and so at the time I uh, I had a girlfriend who lived with me, and I remember thinking to myself, "Wow, I have a no, I have a search condition, 
right? A, a warrantless search condition. I wonder what's going to happen if my girlfriend says to my parole officer, hey, I don't want you to come in our house, like if I'm not home, et cetera, or even if I am. And so there were some court cases that were coming up that were being decided at the time by the Supreme Court um, about warrantless searches and everything. So I actually used my experiences on parole to look at um, a search issue. Um, I won't bore all of us, with, but the case is Georgia Randolph. It sort of changed what it meant to go in a house over warrantless search conditions. And I wrote an article in law school about it. I was on law review and we had to write this paper. And so I wrote it and I ended up publishing it and it felt good. It was the first time that folks had listened to what I had to say, right? As someone who was formerly incarcerated, it felt like. And I got to publish it at what I thought was a prestigious university. And so it just made me feel good, right? You get little slip copies in the mail, right? You could give them to your mom and stuff. No one reads it, but you have them. Um, so it was great. And I had, a, I had a great experience with that. But that parole actually fed that. As far as it being a challenge, it was an incredible challenge. My dad was sick at the time, getting travel passes to go back to Boston, where I grew up, um, having travel passes to do a moot court competition out of county, uh, and then, you know, having an exam at nine o'clock in the morning and your PO shows up at 830, asks you to drop a urine, right? Meanwhile, you're just trying to study con law and get over to school so you can get your coffee before the exam. So there's stuff, right, that goes along with that. Um, not to mention, I didn't have a driver's license. How do you get to the PO's office? It's not an agreement, you know, so all of that. Um, so yes, I was on parole and yes, it was a challenge, but I will say I used it, um, used it to, uh, you know, to, to advance my own career. And, and so I think there's, there is some value there, even if it's a little bit. I was on probation when I was in school. I was on collaborative court, um, drug court for two years and it made life very difficult. Um, but I kind of laugh about it now because <laughs> all my counselors in drug court used to tell me this will build resilience. You know, it'll help you learn to overcome obstacles in your life. And even though I hated hearing that from them at the point when I was going through it, um, I think it's very true. Um, learning how to navigate testing in drug court, we tested, you know, in phases, different amounts of time. So anywhere from seven days a week to three days a week to however often, whatever phase we were in, um, I had to, I was a brand new mom. Uh, so I was going to drug court during the day, taking evening classes, raising an infant child. And um, I was sharing a little bit before the webinar started how, sometimes my grades had to suffer a little bit for my sanity. Um, but overall, I think it was worth it. And I just think that um, sometimes things might not make us happy in the moment, but when we look back, maybe we see a purpose in it. Um, so I'm just grateful I was able to get through drug court. I actually had to skip a test one time because I was graduating drug court and my professor was really kind. I was like, um, I have this like important event <laughs> I have to go to where I'm graduating from drug court <laughs> and he's like wow he was so excited for me um and I got to make up my exam another day so um yeah it was pretty it was pretty pretty tough but I did it I'm here I'm here <laughs> like here this is pretty amazing so yeah definitely thank you so thank much you. oh sorry go ahead Joe so for me, the first time I was in college, I was on probation, but then I dropped out real quick. The second time I wasn't. But what I've seen with my students is I've actually, I've had to like intercede sometimes when, because I have students on federal parole, state parole and probation, and I'll have to write letters, meet parole officers, meet probation officers, right? If they email me, I have to be like, I can't tell you nothing right? I can't. But then if the student tells me I need a letter, I need this, I need that, I think it, it becomes difficult for the students. And I think what happens is in having a program like Rising Scholars or an Underground underground Scholars or, or, or Project Rebound is we get to have that interceding where like a letter from a director can go a long way. A letter from a professor can go a long way. Like most recently, we got one of my students permission to go to Boston with us to a conference and, and she's on probation and she's excited because she gets to go. But we wrote, we wrote that letter, right? Imagine having to navigate that by herself, 
without the support of, of who we are. And, and I think that's the importance of having a program like this on campus is, you know, sometimes just a simple call from, hey, this is the director of Rising Scholars. I know you want my, my student to do this. They're doing really great. Can we get that condition removed? And then the student calling back and being like, they don't want me to do that anymore. Thank you so much. But I think that's the benefit of having us in, in these positions so that we can ease those barriers that they may face. I wanna add a, just a little, little bit. Um, we, I have a student that lives on campus at Tom Parole. They, just, they parole straight into UCI and their PO was trying to get a key card to go into their uh, student housing and campus wouldn't let them have one. And then they were also kept referring to him as, as what is it, the felon or the convict or something like that, their pro officer. And then the student housing kept correcting them and telling them, you mean our, our student, this is our student. And so I think um, I, he shared that story with me and, and yeah, I really appreciated it. I'm glad that he can have some type of empowerment just you know, by being here on campus. And having someone to just something to kind of push back against his his PO, you know. I think when I was writing this question down, um, I was expecting, you know, like negative student experiences, you know, being on parole and community supervision or probation. Um, so I want to thank you all for turning that around and giving me, you know, the positive outlook. Um, the positive responses and how you kind of use this um, to make you even stronger. I think that's, you know, every single one of you all did that. So thank you. That was, that was amazing to hear. Um, and before we get to the audience q and I just had one final question. Um, if each of you can state one to two things that you believe would ensure that formerly incarcerated students succeed and complete their academic goals on campus, what would those one to two things be? I'll start. start. Oh, oh yeah, please. Go ahead, no, Jamie. no, Hector, please. No. I'll, I'll just say um, this is very general because there are multiple needs, but I would say tailored holistic services for our student populations. And I think they differ in every stage of their academic career. Yeah, I, I would just go back to, you know, I hate to sound like a broken record, but I do think community is important, and I think it is the most important piece. At least it was for me. I, I'm envision, you know, I'm remembering going to law school and not being able to talk to a lot of folks about this, except for close friends or family, and then feeling and not understanding how law school worked. I didn't know what law review was. I was a first gen law student. Um, and, and not really feeling comfortable asking right those questions to folks. Um, not really seeing anyone there that looked like me or had my background, I should say. Um, and, and so not really knowing whether this, I was going to be successful doing this or whether there were other options to me. I, and I, I know, so I think all of this stuff is sort of woven together, right? We just talked about, I think, you know, space on campus, you know, having folks that are there to support you in a community. Um, part of that also is, right, the, the faculty and administration have to be like that whole thing with the housing you just talked about, Hector, right? Like, I think my students are often surprised. They work so hard to get to Long Beach and then they run into discrimination or stigma, right? From a faculty member, an administrator or a fellow student that they didn't, they, they're like, aren't we beyond this, right? Like I worked so hard to get here to a space where everyone is pro-social and working towards their future and I'm still dealing with this stuff. And it's sort of a, a slap in the face, right? A realization that this is, just exists. Right, it exists for professors who are formerly incarcerated. You know, I submit a paper and I get a review back, and the review is, "How can we trust your data? You're formerly incarcerated." What? Because I'm writing. What do you mean? Right, like so, my positionality is actually like used as a negative, right? In a lot of respects, when I'm when I'm doing research. So, this stuff doesn't end. I hate, you know, I, I hate to be sort of a Debbie Downer on this, but it just doesn't. And I and I think the most important thing colleges can do is support, right, and and be and understand that we're human beings first and we're students first, right? And that all that other stuff is secondary and way in the past for many of us. 
So being able to talk to folks about that, not having 15 minutes before they boot you out, right? And then make you come back to do your second felony or whatever, you know, I think it's ridiculous. So I just think, you know, all of that woven together, I think is support, generally speaking, in my mind. And, and you know, that's a space on campus, that's other students, that's a club, that's a, whatever it is, that's financial resources, that's housing. So yeah, I, I think support is big. I know that's sort of a general answer. I apologize for my vagary, but um, yeah, I think those interpersonal connections are, are, are probably the most important piece. Um, I just wanted to comment on some of the things I'm seeing in the chat with adding justice to DEI. And actually, I just saw this really cool meme on Instagram where they talk about justice is the part where you ask who made the table that you're bringing everyone to and why did they make that table in the first place? Um, I don't know, maybe people can look it up. It's a really cool take on um, DEI and justice. Um, but I do want to say that um, one thing I'm really happy that UCI is doing is we're working on an allyship training for justice impacted students, whether they're incarcerated or formerly incarcerated. And we're actually launching that um, this spring. And we're going to be inviting um, administrators, faculty, other staff, and students to the training. Um, and then we'll be offering it year round um, in about hour and a half um, virtual trainings. And we're going to break it up into three parts. So we're really hoping that this training will um, help people see the history behind mass incarceration, um, lived experiences of what people go through with incarceration and how people can support students on campus and who are incarcerated. Um, I think that's one of the first things that we have to do so people have that knowledge moving forward and are intentional with how they interact with students. Um, the other thing is, I with the space and everything, I think it's really important to have designated counselors, academic advising counselors for this population. Um, and the third thing is, um, I think it's really hard when institutions, when these higher ed institutions have policies and procedures and they wanna lock everyone into this one policy, you know, well, that's how all of our students need to be treated. Um, but I think everything is so fluid and everybody is so different that we really can't lock people into like one all encompassing policy or procedure that's um, that an institution has because it really, it, it blocks people out from be, receiving the same support. Um, I think people need to look at policies and procedures in a different light, look at how we can support everybody, whether that be in different ways or similar ways. But I just, I, I think that's a really big part of it. Um, helping people understand what mass incarceration is and what people go through, um, being able to change policy to support more people, more students, and having designated um, counselors and advising counselors to support the students while they're there. I think all these were great. What I would add is representation. I think people that have experienced incarceration and people that have been experiencing incarceration and, and are there for other people, right? Because I've also experienced people that have experienced an incarceration and are really there just for themselves, right? Because um, that's, I think that's the most important thing, someone to advocate in those spaces, spaces when they're doing policies, when they're talking about policies, right? Um, to be able to approach, I think is, is the relationships with like deans, vice presidents, presidents, and like, hey, this policy affects my student population this way, right? Can we, I think, but when that person is there with the right intentions, and I think providing our, our students as we grow, you know, underground scholars, go project rebound, rising scholars at community colleges, providing them pathways, that aren't just gonna pigeonhole them and like all you can do is formally incarcerated student work, right? What is the work that you could do above that? Can, right? And because we've already seen a bunch of professors that are formally incarcerated, and, and now we're seeing staff members that are formally incarcerated coming into these programs. How are we gonna help them be more intentional? I think the best thing that I've heard from one of my students is like, how do I become you, right? How do I become the director? And, I, and, and that's beautiful, right? But if I wasn't here, would that be something he could see? And, and, I, and I think as we, as we grow these programs and we think about these intentions, now imagine 
in five to 10 years, there's a vice president of student services or academic affairs that's formerly incarcerated. Then now the student doesn't just see themselves in a formerly incarcerated student program, but they see themselves as a part of the institution, right? And, and that's a job I can have. And I, and I think that's what's gonna be really important for us as we move forward is that representation within, you know, there's a bunch of professors here in Mount Sac that have been incarcerated. that are now coming out, you know, with their experiences and everywhere. So I think it's still going to be intention of having people to, to, to service them in, in leadership capacities also. But I'm going to say it again, that are not just in it for themselves. Right, because I've had I have experienced that. And, and, and I think that's, that'll be the downfall of us all. If we all start thinking that this is just going to be some paycheck for somebody, because we also have to understand that we're here, because some of us suffered and some of us are still suffering, and we're going to continue to be here. So when we take these positions, this is the understanding that you've got to understand that, that I'm here because someone's incarcerated right now and I need to be here when they get out and they come home. But they're still facing time and they're still struggling right now. So, right, this is what we have to understand. It's not just for me, it's for those that are coming home. Thank you for that, Joe. I think it's um, really important to emphasize that because, yeah, we can have representation all the way, but the intent behind that, you know, is really the, the motivating factor um, on creating that change. So I really appreciate uh, you all giving me your insight and, and thoughts on that last question. I will now be moving on to the Q&A function so that we can answer a few questions. Uh, from the audience members. I did see, um, just as a reminder for everyone to please put the questions in the Q&A. I did see early on a question in the chat that I will ask because I think it's really important. Um, is there a current process for training professors on you know, the current and formerly incarcerated student experience and how to be able to best serve these students? Um, and if so, what is your involvement in, you know, having or helping create these training processes? Um, I'll give a shout out to um, a, uh, a company that does this, Breaking Bars, um, Brittany Morton's shop. Uh, she works at Homeboy, um, does fantastic work, was a master's student at Long Beach. I sat in her thesis committee when she developed the training. Um, I am the as many folks know, I work, you know, helping formerly incarcerated uh, folks become lawyers. And so I have a nonprofit, um, California System Involved Bar Association, and Brittany's actually putting together a training for us as well uh, to go into law schools and talk to faculty, staff, students uh, about the experience of being formerly incarcerated and then going to law school, right? And what that's like. Um, she does it at the undergraduate level too, has come to Long Beach a few times, and I think some other CSUs and maybe even a UC. Um, but so, yeah, I was a little bit involved. She did all the work. I sort of sat on the thesis committee, um, so I wasn't that involved. But we did work together. We were working on the CCBA training, and um, yeah, I, I think it's made a difference. It has at Long Beach, I think. Um, I can't speak to other universities, but I know that the folks that went through the training on our campus really got a lot out of it um, and learned a lot about our experiences that maybe they weren't familiar with um, prior to. So, yeah, I was going to give the same plug to Brittany. And she did build that training with the input of formerly incarcerated students and staff members and people that experienced her. It wasn't just Brittany. She fought and forwent a longer graduation period because she fought to include the names of the people that collaborated with her as part of that project. And, and, and I think when you have people like that, right, these trainings come from a genuine, uh, uh, like, like that's a real one right there that, that she, she could have graduated a lot earlier, but she wanted, she made sure to give everybody credit for what she had put forth with the, with, we changed the name, we call it the homie training because we say we don't call anybody in the street an ally, um, but it's that, right? It's intentional. And, and I think that's a real good training. And she's been doing it a lot in a lot of community colleges. So I'll just say again that um, UC Irvine is building a training program to support incarcerated and formerly incarcerated students. We already do um, training with our faculty, but this will be offered to future faculty be a more in-depth um, orientation into what um, higher education in prison is. 
And we are working with underground scholars. Lifted is working with underground scholars, the student success initiatives, and also Project Rebound in um, developing this training, which will have panels of formerly incarcerated students on it. Um, and also, like I said, go more into depth um, with the historical context, like legal context, and then also do trainings on um, trauma-informed care and other, um, other topics related to this field. That's really amazing to hear. Shout out to the people, you know, who have assisted with these trainings that will probably not benefit from, from them, uh, but are doing it for, you know, the benefit of others. So that's, that's amazing to hear. Um, moving on to the next question. How have, and this is open to anyone, how have you walked through the stigma of being formally incarcerated? And do you have any ideas of good journals that speak about this stigma? I'll speak to the journal real quick. Uh, I love Journal of Prisoners on Prisons. Um, it goes inside and they're open to scholarship that is um, done by formerly incarcerated folks. Uh, and, you know, don't, don't kill the messenger here on the name, but Journal of Offender Rehabilitation uh, has some stuff that you, uh, that, that's pretty valuable that I like uh, in Punishment and Society, I think is a journal that I would also recommend. I think I created research that centered on my strengths and the strengths of those that have been incarcerated. It's a kind of, so I tell my students when your professor tells you there's nothing that you experience that is beneficial, I'll be like, well, you could tell him Hernandez in 2019 said X, Y, and Z, right? Hernandez 2021, hustling in higher education. Me, Danny said X, Y, and Z. These are the skills that we have. Right, Halkovic. I think those are the things that I began to do. And, and I think I'm always going to live with the stigma that I think that the, in my dissertation, what I found that we rarely address is the internalized stigma that we face on our own, that sometimes we have to mitigate ourselves. Because at this point, I got a master's, like every manager on this campus, I got a PhD, right? Like most PhDs. And, and, and sometimes it's me, but sometimes it's me. And, and with this research that I created, listening to like how highly successful and amazing we are. I think that the, the, the sometimes is remembering, right? All like the great things that Irene Sotelo did, all the great thing that Adrian Vasquez is, is doing, right? Like my friends and, and having that community helps me walk through it because when I'm in the room full of managers, I'm the only one that's ever been incarcerated, right? But, at this point, I got more education than some of them people too. So I, I think you get to, you know, you get to feel yourself sometimes. You know, you, I think I have to consistently remind myself, right? Like I, I am an expert. I've had to defend my positionality as an expert, as a resource, as, as a creator of research, right? As, as a developer of programs, uh, like I have the skills to do what I do and no one's giving me a job because I face that too. Alrighty, we'll go on to the next question. Um, so in one of the previous seminars, we brought up how probation and our parole officers play a significant role in the quality of the reentry experience. Um, with such varying opportunities, how can policy, nonprofits, agencies, and schools work together to widen networks so that the chance for success is increasingly probable to increase the chance for a positive reentry experience? Um, I'm just going to speak to my experience in a collaborative court system, um, which was about six years ago, but um, it's still really focused on um, people just going and getting a job. Like that was their whole ideal of reintegration. Um, get a job, pay your bills. Um, they didn't care what type of job. They didn't care if people were working night shifts, you know, they're recovering addicts who were recently released from jail and they didn't care if they were working night shifts, which probably isn't too conducive to their um, healing. But um, I was really adamant about going back to school and I had to fight 
to be able to go back to school instead of get a full-time job. Um, and I, I think that's wrong. I think that schools should be working more closely with um, court systems like this, with um, per probation, parole, with everyone. I know it's starting to happen. I see it in certain arenas, but I think it needs to be bigger. And I think that the people who are working in probation, parole, and also in, you know, like drug courts and other courts, um, they know that there's really an opportunity for students to succeed, that they get the money they need for the school, they can get housing, they can be supported with community and all the things that they want people to do when they're on probation anyway, but it can literally all be provided, I think, by going back to school and not everybody is given that opportunity. So I think that if the schools work more closely with these different groups, then hopefully people will see that by going back to school, you'd be meeting all of the requirements that they ask you to do anyway. Yeah, I'll just say that early on, we talked about sort of flipping the parole probation script, right? So that it benefited us and our credit. Let's be clear, right? I think that was a little bit of an anomaly in both instances, right? I mean, they, there are obstacles set up by these folks that make it more difficult to attain higher education. That's just, right, it is. Now, are, is it getting better? Absolutely. I mean, but I can tell you when I was inside and people found my book studying for my LSATs, right? I was told like, you're a piece of crap. You're never going to do this, right? By the guy that was shaking down my hut, right? He's telling me all this stuff and I'm going like, really? Like, you know, so I, I, I do think, um, that we have a ways to go, um, but I, I agree that absolutely we need closer communication, closer contact, right? We need to be cooperative about this. We get referrals all the time uh, from supervisor or from folks that are supervising uh, clients. And, um, you know, we're grateful for those connections, um, but, you know, there are other things, right? Travel passes, interstate compacts, things where those could be eliminated and, and this could all go a lot easier, right? Um, so yeah, I, I do think there's a ways to go and I don't want to paint it as, as, as rosy as maybe it was made out to be when we first talked about this. I also just want to point out too, that a lot of people in corrections, um, particularly have a particular feeling about people who are incarcerated, who are incarcerated or were incarcerated receiving higher education. Why do they get free education? when I don't get free education? Or how come I don't have my, you know, master's degree and they are getting a degree? Um, and I think that whole mentality has to change in order for people to really see the benefits of education for all of our population. Anybody who receives an education makes it better for our community as a whole. Um, but yeah, I think that that whole stigma needs to go away too. The why them, not me kind of thinking yeah like it's zero sum and that we're taking right a spot from and that's <laughs> that's not reality right i was gonna mention the incarcerated student bill of rights right that was passed in, in the law and really building that out sticking to it um you know and making sure that cdc is working closely with you know community colleges and four-year institutions um and having that programming also um, consist of extracurricular activities, like men uh, Jen mentioned earlier. Um, it's not what happens outside of the classroom is just as important as what happens inside the classroom. Um, so, yeah. I think for me, it's been about these intentional relationships. I have with the public defender's office and getting in and presenting during their lunch hour presentations presenting the parole officers, presenting the probation officers, maintaining those relationships with probation officers, parole officers, federal parole officers, right? I, I think that has been key for us here at Mount SAC to get the amount of student um, referrals that we get. Like we get students that are fighting cases with the public defender's office they, and they're told like, go to school uh, and we'll see what we can do for you. And, and I think those have been intentional for us to have in that, that, that office. So now it's a diversion type program, right? It, it, it becomes beneficial for them and, and having, I think you just gotta find your champions in each of those areas 
we have a, a Miss uh, Kershawn Jackson at the Public Defender's Office for us that like she be she be making me look like I walk on water some days, and I'm like, ma'am. But I think it's it's that right. I I think it's those intentional relationships that she's like, this is what rising scholars could do. Send your students there, or send you know. And we talk to them, and we we don't call them your clients. We don't call them your. We call them our future students. Right. I I I'm in recovery, so so I knew automatically I was gonna hit all the drug treatment centers, right? Because I already knew they were coming to Mount Sac, so now they need the help. And I think it, it was intentional for me to just. I think have that 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 relationship with all those people, and and I think also being intentional of understanding for me particularly at the community college is a different type of student than a student at the four year university. My students sometimes are still using, sometimes uh, and so we have to kind of contend with that and having that relationship with the student itself themselves, right? To like be like they may relapse and not come back this spring, but they'll come back next fall, or they'll come back in the summer. And we don't chastise them in any way for anything that they do. I'm gonna also ask a very timely question um, that asks, how can we establish substantive, substantive, I always struggle with that word, sorry, educational pathways for youth in the juvenile system, especially now with the closure of DJJ, giving way to long-term commitments at the county level? I know we're about to start here at Mount Sac and really, I think it's also dictated by funds, right? Do we have the money to scale up a service like that? You know, like originally we started a, a grant to serve people on adult felony probation. Now we got the Rising Scholars Network grant that allows us to be a little bit more open with who we serve, right? And it's always gonna be like, is there, I think sometimes colleges and universities are left out of funding opportunities that would allow for them to, to be more intentional in the services they provide versus if, if you know, if like CSUOB and Mount Zach and Irvine could apply for a county grant, right? That are, that they're giving out, you know, like 1.5 million over the next three years, but they wanna give them to like community-based organizations, but then the community-based organization wants to send the student to us, right? And we may not have the, the we don't say no, but we may not have the, 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 the the upscalability to serve. I, right now, I'll tell y'all the truth. I have 178 enrolled students here at Mount Sac, right? So if I start serving more students, it takes away from each and every one of these students. And I, and I think that that's the way you'll do it is by funding and allowing universities and colleges to tap into those funding streams as well. Yeah, I was gonna mention that uh, I started at, uh, at the beginning of this call meant talking about my uh, challenges with understanding how to navigate higher ed and the value of higher ed. And I think, uh, you know, that's even more so true for youth. Um, so I think it's also important to develop programming that introduces them to higher ed and helps them understand the value and how to navigate it. Um, I, at least for myself, I know I come from a background where you know, no one in my family knew what it meant to go to college. Like, we know it's good. We just don't know why, you know, or or what we can do with it. And so really developing that type of programming for youth, I think, would be helpful. And just like, I know for underground scholars, we have incarceration at college, um, which starts to introduce, you know, youth into higher ed, and they get high school credit for it. Um, so I think those types of programs are equally important as providing like four credit course courses. Um, I know here at Orange County, we're really lagging or lagging behind on getting four credit course uh, courses from community colleges inside, which also limits uh, UCI, um, you know, being a, or any other four year institution from being able to go in there and and provide services as well. Um, I think it's important um, for any type of youth setting, whether it's a detention facility or high school or junior high, um, for people to go in and share 
their success in higher education. I think people who can see people from their neighborhoods who have succeeded, it's really impactful on them even deciding to go into higher education. I also think that our system, like as a larger whole, needs to do a lot better at introducing um, all the opportunities that higher education offers. I think that, you know, we're still stuck in the, I'm going to be a teacher, lawyer, doctor, um, like these four or five main fields, that's all college is going to offer to you. And then, and then you go to school and you're like, oh, you can build robots for a living or like, make video games and get paid tons of money. And I don't think that's really getting brought into the schools enough where students are learning like you literally can learn about anything that you're passionate about, get a degree and get paid for it. And, and I think that that's really important for um, young people to hear. Thank you for your comments. Our next question, I think we have time for like two more questions. Um, what do you wish more non-formally incarcerated higher ed staff or faculty knew? Um, so I think that I wish um, more higher ed faculty and staff uh, knew just how um, bright and capable folks that have done time or have been involved in the carceral system are. Um, I think this piggybacks on some things that we've talked about earlier today, which is, you know, this idea that Joe mentioned, you know, well, there aren't a lot of us in administration, right? And I hear in my own work, people say, well, our population is really not into administration. Well, we're not into it because we haven't had the opportunity to do it, right? And so I think, you know, the point is, is that I'm a big proponent of right next one up and and you know I don't want to do this work forever right I want the next person to fill my role as a faculty member who's formerly incarcerated right who's the new hot thing right like I want that needs to keep going and I think if we're going to build uh, one of the things that I think is important is is opening these positions up whether it's administration whether it's staff whether it's faculty whether it's directors to folks with records Right? And, and, and show them that these are available pathways to them um, in part so that we can move things along, right? And so that we can keep folks that are fresh in the movement um, moving up, progressing, um, and that they can see advancement. I think that's really, really important. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I think I'll add on Dr. Banal, like, like we're amazing. We're doing amazing things. And I think for underground scholars to, 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 to emerge out of the student group and be where it's at, like that's amazing right there in itself. You got Maria at Cal State Northridge. She's doing the coding co uh, camps. She, right, like she works at, at, like, she, right, in a completely field that, right, in computer science information technology. But I think those things and being successful, highly successful, I think those are the things that we have to acknowledge. The things that we've done and are available. I got students here that are like architect majors and I'm like, right, math majors and, and, and all that stuff and, and making sure that they, you know, we got a cat at Long Beach who wants to be an English professor, right, and seeing the, these opportunities for them and they're amazing in their own right and just the stuff that they do. And, and I think one thing I did got from my dissertation and it kind of shook me is one of my participants said, why are you saying you're giving me a second chance? This is the first chance I've had, right? This is the first chance at life that I had. And for some of these students, this is the first chance that that that, that, we're, that they're getting. And when that participant told me that, it really changed the way that I looked at it because it's not it's that we were robbed of any chances, right? And now that we're here, right? Look at the things that they're that we're doing. Look at the things that that are being accomplished, right? A, a, as a goal in, in this area. And then I think so. Just remember that that. That you 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 have right here four highly, right, productive members of this community. This is what everybody in this community can accomplish, right, with the right kind of support and the right kind of help. Beautifully said. Thank you so much. Uh, that is all the time that we have for questions. So I really wanted to thank our panelists for this beautiful and very real conversation. 
Uh, we also want to extend our gratitude to the audience for attending this inspirational discussion that will hopefully serve many incarcerated and justice impacted students and communities. We invite you to fill out our quick survey for today's event, and we will be posting the recording of today's discussion on our YouTube channel, which is the Michelson 20MM Foundation by tomorrow. In the meantime, you can stay engaged by signing up for our newsletter at 20mm.org to receive news and updates about our Smart Justice Initiative, as well as our other events and programs. Additionally, if you would like to learn more about our California's best practices, a link to download them is in the chat. And again, I just want to give a really big shout out to all of the panelists that we've had throughout this entire series. Um, they've all been so inspirational. I've learned so much with every single webinar. And I really just wanna thank you all for helping build this community, which we have continued to do so through every webinar, um, which is really you know, what was the theme of today. Uh, so I really appreciate all of the panelists for sharing and, and teaching us about your experience and beyond. And just thank you all for taking the time to join us. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.